Charles Robert Darwin was born in Shrewsbury, Shropshire, England on the 12th of February 1809 at his family's large Georgian home known as the Mount. Son to Robert Darwin, a wealthy doctor and financier, and his wife Susanna Darwin, Charles was the fifth of their six children. Charles Darwin, henceforth just Darwin, had a childhood mixed between the scientific world and the religious world of 19th century Anglican England. On one hand, he was not only the son of a medical doctor and free thinker, he was also the grandson of the renowned botanist Dr Erasmus Darwin. This background inspired within Darwin a curiosity about the natural world, so much so that even his teacher and preacher noted as much in November 1817. On the other hand, he was immersed in both Anglican and Unitarian Christianity, being baptised as a baby in the Anglican Church of St Chad in November 1809, yet attending the Unitarian Chapel services with his mother and other members of his maternal family, the Wedgwoods. This mix of worlds and the conflicts that it causes would shroud Darwin throughout his life, being the background in which new ideas fought with dogma and from which each side was trying to find truth without condemning their souls. Being born into a rich family meant that Darwin had the opportunity to gain a class of education that was out of reach for the common man. His education started young. He was able to read his grandfather's scientific work and attend a church school. In July 1817, unfortunately, his mother died, and this meant that Darwin had to join his older brother, Erasmus, at a nearby Anglican Shrewsbury school as a boarder in September 1818. Darwin spent the summer of 1825 as an apprentice doctor, helping his father treat the poor of Shropshire, before him and his brother Erasmus started attending the University of Edinburgh Medical School in October 1825, which at that time was the best medical school in all of the United Kingdom. It didn't take long for Darwin to realise that medical science just wasn't for him. He found the lectures boring and the surgery distressing. He squirmed at even the slightest sight of blood. It's not surprising then that he started to neglect his studies, but this didn't stop him from making it onto the course's second year. It was during this second year in Edinburgh that Darwin joined the Polinian Society, a student-led natural history group which featured lively debates on radical materialistic ideas where orthodox religious views would be pitted against the concepts of science. It was from these events that Darwin got the opportunity to assist the zoologist Robert Edmund Grant in his investigations into the anatomy and life cycle of marine invertebrates in the Firth of Forth. This resulted in Darwin presenting on the 27th of March 1827 to the Polenian Society the discovery that the black spores found on the oyster shells were actually the eggs of skate leech, an impressive discovery for any scientist, let alone an unenthusiastic medical student. One day, while in the presence of Darwin, Grant praised the French zoologist Jean-Baptiste Lamac's idea that offspring inherit the characteristics that their parents exhibit. For instance, Lamarck believed that if a blacksmith worked hard and developed strong muscles from his hard work and then had a son, that his son would also inherit the strong muscles as well. This praise by Grant perhaps ignited the first semblance of an idea of selection within Darwin's brain because it triggered Darwin into remembering that he had read a similar idea in his grandfather's journals, especially his grandfather's 1794 manuscript Zoonomnia, which featured a poetic fantasy of gradual creation. While Darwin was enjoying his time debating, assisting in natural history research and learning about plant classification while at Edinburgh Medical University, his actual medical studies were being greatly neglected, much to the annoyance of his father, who was bankrolling him. This neglect got to such a state that his father decided that instead of being a failed doctor, Darwin would instead become an Anglican county parson, and so he paid for Darwin to undertake a Bachelor of Arts degree at the world-renowned Christ College in Cambridge, which he started in July 1828. This position would seem to suit Darwin more than that of pursuing a medical profession, Darwin stated that, quote, I did not then in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible. End quote. Still yet, Darwin had much preferred being out in nature, riding and shooting, than studying the Bible. In Darwin's first couple of months at Christ College, he was able to connect with his second cousin, William Darwin Fox, who was just finishing up his studies. Fox had quite an impressive collection of butterflies and this introduced Darwin to the study of entomology, 
and motivated him to start one of his most famous pastimes, beetle collecting. It was through his cousin Fox that Darwin met who was to become one of his closest friends throughout his life, a professor of botany called John Stevens Henslow. It was through Professor Henslow that Darwin was introduced to many of the other leading naturalists of the time. Darwin in fact spent so much time around this botany professor that he gained an unassuming title, The Man Who Walks With Henslow. Darwin did much more than just shadow Professor Henslow though. He started, for instance, the infamous Gourmet Club, also known as the Glutton Club. In this club, Darwin and his fellow students feasted upon the birds and beasts of the land foreign to the British palate. Darwin ate hawk and bittern heartily, but he couldn't stomach the taste of brown owl. It was clear that Darwin was enjoying his time in Cambridge, as he was able to study what he was actually interested in, such as natural philosophy and natural theology. Darwin was even able to apply himself to his studies, placing him 10th out of 178 candidates for their ordinary degree in 1831. The books that Darwin read that inspired within him a zeal to contribute to the natural sciences was Alexander von Humboldt's personal narrative of scientific travels from 1799 to 1804. No doubt this also inspired some wanderlust within Darwin, and so he planned to visit Tenerife with some classmates after his graduation. But first, in preparation for this trip, he joined the famous geologist Adam Sedgwick for a trip to Wales in order to map some strata, that is the different layers of rock that you can see in a rock wall or cliff. After leaving Sedgwick in Wales to continue his research, Darwin returned home to find a letter from Professor Henslow. This letter informed Darwin that he was being proposed as a suitable naturalist for a self-funded supernumerary place on HMS Beagle under a captain, Robert Fritzroy. If accepted, Darwin was to act as a gentleman scholar, not a mere bug collector. The objective of the expedition was to chart the South American coastline, where Darwin would get ample opportunities to indeed collect bugs, but also many other types of animal. This type of research was not rare in the 19th century, as humanity was becoming increasingly interested in understanding the natural world in which it found itself. Darwin's father would be expected to pay for his son's passage on this two-year expedition, and it's easy to understand why he was not at all amused. Not only had Darwin dropped out of his degree in Edinburgh, costing him money, but he had also had to pay for another degree in Cambridge. And now his son wanted to forego his religious duties to gallivant around the globe on a ship collecting bugs. Putting it simply, Darwin's father was recorded as regarding it as a waste of time, and in another timeline, perhaps Darwin never joined the crew of HMS Beagle, and instead lived the life of a priest. But this didn't happen. Instead, something clearly was acting behind the scenes. Maybe it was Darwin's pleading or his family's big hearts, but his father was eventually persuaded by his brother-in-law to fund his son's participation in the now famous second voyage of HMS Beagle. HMS Beagle was a Cherokee class 10 gun brig sloop. It was a beautiful ship, but rather small for the time. It measured just 27 metres long and 7 metres wide, and weighed 235 tonnes. After a few days' delay, the ship left port on the 27th of December, 1831, the start of an almost five-year journey. Darwin immediately began writing careful notes on what he was observing during his voyage, despite having long bouts of seasickness. He acknowledged he lacked expertise in all areas of research except geology and entomology, but this didn't dampen his enthusiasm to collect specimens and send them back to Cambridge. Most of Darwin's zoological notes deal with marine invertebrates, the first of which were plankton, caught during a calm spell while heading towards Cape Verde. Darwin and Captain Fritzroy quickly became friends, with the captain gifting Darwin books on geology. These books described how land slowly rises over time, and this helped Darwin understand how the seashells that he found high up in the white bands of rock present in the volcanic cliffs of Cape Verde would have come into existence, despite them being so far from the sea. The first South American country that Darwin reached was Brazil, but the sight of this new world was bittersweet. He was delighted in the lush life of the tropical forests, but he was disgusted at the sight of slavery, the trade of which had been outlawed in his native Britain and its empire for 24 years. And slavery itself would be completely outlawed in Britain and its empire before Darwin even made it back home. Darwin left Brazil for Argentina, 
While surveying in Patagonia, Darwin discovered the bones of a huge mammal alongside modern seashells. He also found the tooth of a giant ground sloth, which caused quite a stir among scientists back in England. While in Patagonia, Darwin got to ride with the gorchos, a type of Argentinian cowboy. These gorchos showed Darwin that the two types of rhea that existed there had overlapping territories yet existed as separate species. This no doubt caused Darwin to raise an eyebrow or two. Then during this journey further south he noted that he saw staggered plains of shingle and seashells acting as raised beaches at a series of different elevations, which further gave credence to the idea that land that was once underwater was now far above sea level. After leaving Argentina, Darwin arrived in Chile where he experienced an earthquake that was so strong that it raised some of the ground up as much as 2.7 metres. This exposed stranded mussel beds above the high tide line, which was remarked on by Captain Fritz Roy. Darwin had actually experienced the gradual process of the continent emerging from the ocean as he had read from his geology books. He theorised that as the land rose, oceanic islands sunk and coral reefs grew around them to form atolls. Sailing from Chile, the HMS Beagle headed towards the Galapagos Islands. Once they arrived, Darwin began surveying each island's wildlife, noting that the mockingbirds were similar to those found in Chile, but amazingly, each had differences depending on the island in which it lived. A famous example of these differences is that of what we now call Darwin's finches, where each of the 18 species have varying degrees of difference in their beaks morphology, which allow each species to gain access to different foodstuffs. Obviously, Darwin did not understand this at the time. Instead, he was preoccupied with looking for evidence attaching wildlife to a religious centre of creation idea. While on the Galapagos Islands, Darwin heard about the slight variations in the shape of shells in each island's tortoise population, but he failed to collect any, despite eating many of them during his stay. In fact, Darwin's appetite did not seem to have changed much from his school days. During this voyage, he snacked upon many different exotic animals, including armadillo, ostrich and puma, which he said tasted like veal. After taking their fill of the archipelago's animals, HMS Beagle left the Galapagos Islands to travel across the massive Pacific Ocean to Tahiti, and then on to New Zealand, and finally to Australia. In Australia, Darwin was able to hunt marsupials, netting himself a potaroo, also known as a rat kangaroo, and even getting the chance to touch a platypus, which seemed so unusual that Darwin thought it was almost as though two distinct creators had been at work designing the animals of the old world and the marsupials of the new. After leaving Australia, Captain Fritzroy began writing the official narrative of the Beagle's voyage. He eventually got to read Darwin's journal and proposed incorporating it into his narrative. This would eventually be written as a separate third volume on geology and natural history. While in the Indian Ocean, Captain Fritzroy investigated how the atolls of the Caucasus Islands had formed, after which his expedition sailed to Mauritius and then on to South Africa. In Cape Town, Darwin received a letter from his sister Catherine, which briefly mentioned that the little books that he had been sent home had been greatly enjoyed by everyone who had read them. It horrified Darwin that his careless words went to print, but ultimately, Darwin took the view that it just couldn't be helped. This was perhaps the right attitude to take, because his fame was spreading among the elites of British scientific society. Extracts from the letters that he had sent to his friend Professor Henslow had also been read to the Cambridge Philosophical Society and Geological Society of London by Darwin's one-time geology companion Dr Adam Sedgwick. Professor Henslow even sent Darwin's father a letter saying that Darwin would become one of the premier naturalists of their time, and he enclosed some copies of the pamphlet's extracts from the letters addressed to Henslow, which had been printed for private distribution. In another turn of good news, Darwin's father was noted as not moving from his seat until he had read every word of the extracts, and he very much liked Darwin's clear and simple manner of delivering information. So perhaps Darwin's father's money was in fact well spent. After a quick stopover in Brazil so Captain Fritzroy could ensure the accuracy of his longitudinal measurements, HMS Beagle officially set sail to return everyone back home to Britain. During this final leg of the trip, Darwin began organising his notes, writing about the mockingbirds and other species that he had seen on his voyage. He wrote, quote, These birds are closely allied in appearance to the Thenka of Chile or the Calandra of La Plata. In each island, each kind is exclusively found. Habitats are all indistinguishable. When I recollect 
the fact that the form of the body, shape of scale, and general size, the Spaniards can at once pronounce from which island any tortoise might have been brought. When I see these islands in sight of each other and possessed of but a scantly stock of animals, tenanted by these birds but slightly differing in structure and filling the same place in nature, I must suspect that they were all only varieties. The only fact of a similar kind of which I am aware is the constant asserted difference between the wolf-like fox of East and West Falkland Islands. If there is the slightest foundation for these remarks, the zoology of archipelagos will be well worth examining, for such facts would undermine the stability of species. End of quote. This is perhaps Darwin's first expression in addressing that a species might not be immutable, but instead be subject to change. On the 2nd of October, 1836, HMS Beagle finished her second voyage by anchoring at Falmouth in Cornwall. The first thing Darwin did when he got back to Britain was hire a coach to take him to Shrewsbury so he could visit his family, who he had not seen in nearly five years. No doubt enthralled by Darwin's tales of far-off lands and strange creatures, Darwin's dad was encouraged to continue to fund his son's gentleman scholar lifestyle. After seeing his family, Darwin hurried to Cambridge to visit Professor Henslow, who advised him that his collections of specimens needed cataloguing, and so Darwin journeyed to London to find experts to do just this. However, natural history research was being encouraged throughout the British Empire at this time, and this meant that there was a massive backlog of work, and so many species were just being left in storage, and without Darwin applying any pressure, this could easily be the fate of his collection. While in London, Darwin met the famous Scottish geologist Charles Lyell, who argued that the formation of the Earth's crust took place through countless small changes occurring over a vast period of time. An argument, no doubt, that had many similarities with the process of evolution, yet to be theorised by Darwin. By mid-December, Darwin had moved to Cambridge and begun preparing his research for publication. His first paper showed that the South American landmass was slowly rising, and with Lyell's enthusiastic backing, he read it to the Geological Society of London. On the same day, Darwin presented his mammal and bird specimens to the Zoological Society. There, the ornithologist John Gould would announce that the Galapagos birds that Darwin had thought were a mixture of blackbirds and finches were in fact 12 separate species of finches, the now famous Darwin finches. In March 1837, Darwin moved to London to be near his collection and in the process joined Lyell's social circle. This surrounded Darwin with the scientists and experts of the day in which it was encouraged to find a natural cause for the origin of species. So it is no surprise then that by mid-March, barely six months after his return to England, Darwin was speculating in his now famous Little Red Notebook on the possibility that one species does change into another in order to explain how living species which were similar were also distinct over a geographical distribution. By mid-July 1837, Darwin wrote in his second notebook, known as the Bee Notebook, his thoughts on how lifespan affects variation across generations, by theorising on the differences he had observed in the Galapagos tortoises, mockingbirds and rayas. It is here that he sketched out the now famous genealogical branching coming from a single evolutionary tree. By doing this though, he inadvertently made it absurd to talk about one animal being a higher form than another, and this put his ideas against that of Jean-Baptiste Lemax's idea that independent lineages progress to create higher order of forms. While busy in London, Darwin took on editing and publishing the expert reports on his collections, and with a little of Professor Henslow's help, Darwin obtained a treasury grant of a thousand pounds sterling to sponsor a multi-volume book series titled Zoology of the Voyage of HMS Beagle, a sum of money equivalent to about £115,000 in today's money. Darwin's workload was becoming more and more and more as he was writing up his own research but also taking on extra responsibilities, and this immense workload eventually resulted in Darwin's health failing him in which could be termed a form of burnout. Darwin's doctor recommended for the health of his heart that Darwin knock off all work and live in the countryside for a few weeks, and so Darwin went to visit family, where he conversed with his cousin Emma Wedgwood. But he was quickly back to work because by February 1838, Darwin's travel journals were ready to go to print. 
Despite Darwin's high workload once back in London, he continued to theorise on how species change over time in a process which he called transmutation. He questioned every naturalist he could meet, but he was also remarkably open-minded in questioning people with practical experience in selective breeding, such as farmers and pigeon fanciers. While this shows how strong of a character Darwin was, he was also such a strong person that despite his religious beliefs and the religious ocean in which he swam, he included from the offset mankind in his speculations, a highly heretical thought for the time. Though Darwin's health once again took a turn for the worst, being laid up for days on end with stomach problems, headaches and heart palpitations. These problems would badger him for the rest of his life, being particularly bad in times of stress. The cause of Darwin's illness remains unknown to this day, but many people theorise that he picked up a pathogen or some kind of parasite while in South America. After Darwin's health had returned, his thoughts turned to marriage. He jotted down on two scraps of paper, one with a column headed marry and the other not marry. Advantages under marry included a constant companion and a friend in old age, or at least someone better than a dog anyhow. Under not marry, Darwin wrote, less money for books and terrible loss of time, which just goes to show you what kind of giga chad Darwin was. However, he decided that marriage was the better option, and after discussing all his options with his father, he went to visit his cousin, Emma Wedgwood. But he did not get around to asking for a hand in marriage, which is understandable as asking anyone to marry you must be nerve-wracking, even more so if that person is your cousin, who you have known since childhood, because that's one hell of a way to cause a rift in the family if she says no. However, Instead of taking that risk, he simply discussed with her his ideas on how a species might change over time. Once back in London, Darwin came across Malthusianism, the theory explaining that human populations, if they go unchecked, double themselves every 25 years, a geometric progression that results in populations exceeding the food supply, resulting in a large amount of starvation and population die-off. This came to be known as a Malthusian catastrophe. In October 1838, Darwin compared this to Augustine de Candolle's Warring of the Species, which explained how plants struggle for existence among wildlife is kept in check by population boom and busts, and then this affects how a species' numbers are kept roughly stable. Darwin wrote about this time in his autobiography, quote, Fifteen months after I had begun my systematic inquiry, I happened to read for amusement Malthus on population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habitats of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances favourable variations would tend to be preserved, and unfavourable ones would be destroyed. The result of this would be the formation of a new species. Here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. End quote. So Darwin finally had come up with a theory of evolution, but each good theory needs an equally good name. Darwin saw a similarity between farmers picking the best stock through selective breeding and Malthusian nature selecting from chance variants. He combined these beautiful parts in his theory and called it natural selection, as an analogy to what he turned against the artificial selection of selective breeding. Now Darwin had his theory all he needed was a wife, and with the confidence of a gentleman who was about to revolutionise the world, he proposed to Emma Wedgwood, who happily accepted, but expressed that her strong Unitarian beliefs placed concern in her mind for Darwin, as his honest doubts in God might separate them in the afterlife. So Darwin had the support of a loving wife, and he had the theory of evolution through natural selection, but that's not good enough. He needed an overwhelming amount of evidence for his theory for it to have any chance of being scientifically accepted in such a time of religious and scientific contention. Therefore, his theory was to be kept secret and safe for 21 years. While Darwin's main work involved writing on geology and publishing expert reports on the Beagle's collections, he spent 15 years conducting selective breeding research on plants and animals, where he found evidence that population phenotypes could be changed over time. This work greatly helped him refine and substantiate his theory on selection. Darwin also had his theory on atoll formation published in May 1842, after more than three years of work. 
but it was after this that he first put ink to paper about his theory of natural selection. Then by July, Darwin had expanded this jotting into a 230-page essay to be expanded upon with his research results if he died prematurely, a wise move as he continued to suffer from bouts of ill health. In November, Darwin anonymously published a sensational bestseller called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. This book brought about a wide interest in transmutation, both positive and negative, which no doubt prepared the groundwork for his future work to be so readily consumed by all sectors of British society. However, it wasn't until 1845 that Darwin had the definitive evidence that he needed to support his theory, and this evidence wasn't even discovered by himself. It was brought to his attention by his friend and botanist, Joseph Hooker. Hooker had been analysing the plants that Darwin had brought back from the Galapagos. However, unlike the birds which Darwin had brought back, all the plants had accurate localities attached to them, because each plant from each separate island had been pressed and stored with only other plants from the same island. This happy accident avoided the intermixing of individuals from different islands like that which had happened to Darwin's bird collection. Hooker had identified more than 200 species, half of which were unique to the Galapagos archipelago, in which three quarters were confined to single islands, while the other islands possessed endemic forms found nowhere else on Earth. Finally, at last, Darwin had the kind of compelling evidence he needed so he could place great faith in his theory of natural selection being true. He wrote to Hooker saying, I cannot tell you how delighted and astonished I am at the results of your examination. How wonderfully they support my assertion on the differences in the animals of different islands, of which I have always been most fearful. This good time in Darwin's life was not to last though. In a just a reminder of the hard times in which he lived, Darwin's treasured daughter Anne fell ill in 1851 and then eventually died, causing Darwin, who was a loving father, a great amount of grief. Despite this, however, his work eventually continued. He spent eight years working on barnacles, which helped him understand how slight differences in morphology in body parts served different functions in order to meet new conditions. This allowed Darwin to begin a major reassessment in his theory of species formation, and in November 1854, he realised that divergences in the character of descendants could be explained by them becoming adapted to diversified places in the economy of nature. Or in other words, different environmental conditions provide selection pressure for different adaptations to solve problems caused by the environment. By the start of 1856, Darwin was investigating whether eggs and seeds could survive travel across seawater to spread species across oceans, but he was in no rush to publish his work on natural selection. This was, however, till Darwin's old friend Lyell read a paper in 1856 by A. Alfred Russell Wallace titled On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species. Lyell saw similarities between Darwin's thoughts and urged him to publish his ideas to establish precedents. Darwin responded to this saying that he saw no threat in Wallace's work and instead wanted to continue investigating whether eggs and seeds could survive travel across the oceans. However, words are one thing and actions are quite another. Darwin quickly started writing a short paper which he then planned to rapidly expand into a book that would become known as his big book titled natural selection. By 1857, Darwin was in correspondence with Wallace, who asked if his book would examine human origins. Darwin responded that he would avoid that subject, it being so surrounded with prejudices. But he did encourage Wallace to do his own theorising, but being a man of banter, Darwin teased him by saying that, I go much further than you. By June 1858, Darwin had only somewhat written his book when he received a paper from Wallace describing natural selection. This paper shocked Darwin, as it had forestalled his own work, but in an act of character possessed by only those great men of history, Darwin sent Wallace's paper on to Lyell, as requested by Wallace, and though Wallace had not asked for publication, Darwin suggested that he would send it to any journal that Wallace chose. This moment really exemplifies the type of man that Darwin was. He could have stalled, suppressed or attacked Wallace's ideas in order to publish his own, but instead he chose to elevate them, despite the risk that it posed to his own work, a truly commendable act. Yet, it is not Alfred Russell Wallace 
who is credited with the formation of the theory of natural selection. It is Darwin. Why is this? Well, Darwin sent across his own work on natural selection alongside that of Wallace's to Lyrell and Hooker. After some discussion, and with no reliable way to involve Wallace due to him being in Borneo at the time, Lyrell and Hooker decided to present to the Linnean Society both the work of Wallace and Darwin. It was during this presentation that Perputation of Varieties and Species by Means of Natural Selection was presented. However, this was not by Darwin, who, in another sad turn of life, only a few days previous had lost a son to scarlet fever, and was understandably too distraught to attend the conference. Now it is here in the story where you would expect a revolution in thought to occur, and the scientific community to spring into action, but funnily enough, the announcement of the theory of natural selection was met with very little fanfare at all. Even more, the president of the Lenin Society remarked in May 1859, that the year had not been marked by any revolutionary discoveries. How very wrong he was. However, this would not become understood for at least another 13 months, as Darwin struggled to produce the abstract for his big book, as he was suffering again from more ill health. Although he did have great amounts of encouragement from his friends, especially Lyell, who had already arranged to have it published. On the Origin of Species was published on the 22nd of November 1859, and completely unexpectedly, it went on to be extremely popular, with the entire stock of 1,250 copies being oversubscribed when it went on sale. In the book, Darwin set out one long argument of detailed observations, inferences from his research, and considerations against anticipated objections to his claims. At the start of the book, natural selection is simply stated as, quote, as many more individuals of each species are born than can possibly survive, and as consequently there are frequently recurring struggles for existence, it follows that any being, if it varies however slightly and in any manner profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving, and thus be naturally selected. From the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety would tend to propagate its new and modified form. End quote. Darwin also made the case for the common descent of man. He included evidence of homologies and similarities between humans and other mammals. Although he avoided explicit discussion of human origins, his work did imply its significance with the sentence, Light will be thrown on the origins of man and his history. Darwin also outlined sexual selection, hinting that it could explain differences between human races a topic still hotly debated even today outside of zoological circles. And then at the end of the book, he concluded that, quote, There is grandeur in this view of life, and its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone on cycling according to the fixed laws of gravity, from so simple a beginning endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been, and are being, evolved. End quote. On the origin of species caused a large amount of international interest in its ideas, and surprisingly, it was met with less controversy than had been greeted Darwin's popular but less scientific book, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. Which was surprising, because while On the Origin of Species did not explicitly discuss human origins, it did include a number of hints about the animal ancestry of humans. The reviewers and critics of On the Origin of Species asked some really profound questions. For example, the first reviewer asked, If a monkey has become a man, what may not a man become? He then further explained that perhaps these questions are too dangerous for ordinary readers and should perhaps be left to more learned experts, like theologians. It's no wonder that he thought this, being a time where religion seeped into everything. The Church of England had a response to Darwin's work, but this response was mixed. Many clergymen viewed evolution as simply another one of God's many processes to facilitate his creations, while others viewed it as simple heresy and dismissed the religious curvyman and Darwin's ideas out of hand completely. Even Darwin's old Cambridge tutor Dr Adam Sedgwick and his friend Professor Henslow dismissed his ideas, which must have hurt Darwin on a deeply personal level, but then again, Every man has the right to have his own view on things. Even Darwin's close friends Gray, Hooker, Huxley and Lyell expressed reservations about natural selection, 
but gave strong support to Darwin personally, Gray and Lyell sought reconciliation with their Christian faith, or Huxley walked a polarised line between religion and science. Darwin's health was so bad after this publishing that it kept him from attending any public debates, but he made up for this through written rebuttals. Though perhaps the most famous rebuttal or debate was held at Oxford in 1860 between multiple parties, but included the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, who, though not opposed to transmutation of species, argued against Darwin's explanation and human descent from apes. His chief opponent was Joseph Hooker, who argued strongly for Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection. But other speakers included Thomas Henry Huxley and Captain Fritzroy. It was from this debate that we have Thomas Huxley's legendary retort that, quote, He would not be ashamed to have a monkey for his ancestor, but he would be ashamed to be descended from a man who misused his gifts, end quote. That saying became a symbol of the triumph of science over religion. After publishing On the Origin of Species as an abstract of his theory, Darwin pressed on with experiments, research and the writing of his big book, while various scientific discoveries were made that shored up the footing of Darwin's theory. In 1862, Darwin released Fertilisation of Orchids, which gave the first detailed demonstration of the power of natural selection to explain complex ecological relationships while also making testable predictions. In 1863, Thomas Huxley provided evidence of human evolution by showing that anatomically humans are apes. Then the book Naturalists on the River Amazons by Henry Walter Bates provided empirical evidence of natural selection through the descriptions of mimicry. All this attention, debate and praise brought Darwin Britain's highest scientific honour, the Royal Society's Copley Medal, awarded on the 3rd of November 1864, and started what became known as Darwinism. By the end of the 1860s, most scientists agreed that evolution occurred, but it was still hotly debated if this was the main mechanism in the creation of a species at all. Though Darwin continued to press on releasing books, despite his health continuing to fail him, he released The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex in 1871. Darwin provided evidence from numerous sources that showed that humans are animals, both physically and mentally. He also presented his theory on sexual selection to explain impractical animal features, such as the peacock's plumage, as well as the human evolution of culture, differences between sexes, and physical and cultural racial classifications while at the same time emphasising that humans are all the same species. In 1868, Darwin released Variations of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, which was the first part of his planned big book and included an unsuccessful hypothesis on hereditary functioning called pangenesis. In 1872, Darwin released the book The Expression of the Emotions of Man and Animals, which discussed the evolution of human psychology and its continuity with the behaviour of animals, and was one of the first books to ever include printed photographs. The book was incredibly popular, and Darwin was impressed by the general reception, remarking that everybody is talking about it without being shocked, which was surprising to see, as Darwin had concluded the book with, quote, Man with all his noble qualities, with sympathy which he feels for the most abased, with benevolence which extends not only to other men but to the humblest living creature, with his godlike intellect which has penetrated into the movements and constitution of the solar system, with all these exalted powers, man still bears his bodily frame with the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. End quote. This must have been a controversial statement when most of the population viewed man as being made in the image of an almighty god. And then again, Darwin's health continued to degrade. But this didn't stop him from being the first person to recognise the significance of carnivory in plants, which he presented in his book on insectivorous plants, the effects of cross and cell fertilisation in the vegetable kingdom. His very last book focused on his old fascination with how worms caused vegetable mounds. And then, on the 19th of April, 1882, Charles Darwin died. At the time of his death, Darwin was diagnosed with anguinal attacks and heart failure. He died at Down House in what was then part of the county of Kent. 
His last words were to his family, telling his wife Emma, I am not the least bit afraid of death. Remember what a good wife you have been to me. Tell all my children, remember how good they have been to me. Darwin had planned to be buried at St Mary's Churchyard in Down, but at the request of his scientific colleagues, and after public and parliamentary petitioning, Darwin's place of rest was changed. He would instead be buried in honour at Westminster Abbey, close to John Herschel and Sir Isaac Newton. Darwin's funeral was held on Wednesday the 26th of April 1882, and was attended by thousands of people. Darwin was a pious Christian boy growing up in a time of religious and scientific conflict, a time in which fuel for new ideas was abundant. He had the good fortune to be born into a scientific family and to have read his grandfather's journals, the contents of which placed the seed of natural selection in Darwin's mind. He was a lucky man, lucky enough to come from a family which deeply cared for him and could afford to provide him with an education and the resources to become a gentleman scholar in a time when most other men had to toil in the mud and muck to barely survive. He was also lucky enough to be surrounded by curious friends of many different stripes, most of which were not afraid to question him or assist in his research when requested. But I think most importantly, Charles Darwin was a good man. A good man whose life and thinking has left a great legacy for humankind. However, I think Alfred Russell Wallace put it best. He stated that Darwin had, quote, wrought a greater revolution in human thought within a quarter of a century than any man of our time, or perhaps any time, having given us a new conception of the world of life and a theory which itself is a powerful instrument of research, has shown us how to combine into one constant whole the fact accumulated by all the separate classes of workers, and has thereby revolutionised the whole study of nature.